Ankita, an economist with Edelweiss, and I'm delighted to present to you the fifth episode in the series, The Calm Allocators. As we now coexist with the pandemic, we are constantly reminded of Napoleon's great saying, a genius is the man who can do just the average thing when everyone else around is losing his mind. I think it applies to investing more than any other aspect of life. Today, we stand at a juncture of negative growth, high inflation, dismal credit situation, and I can go on and on with macro issues that we are facing. But instead of losing our minds to them, it is essential to continue investing and grip to our philosophy and principles as much as we did in the supposedly old normal now. So in this episode, we'll be talking about progressing from individual stock picking to building a very holistic portfolio and how important or rather not important, constant churning of one's portfolio. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Samit Vartak, founder and CIO of Sage One Investments for this episode. Samit returned to India in 2006 after spending a decade in the US, working with the top-notch names post his MBA from Olin School of Business. He has worked very closely with various companies in the US and India, advising them on business strategy, profit optimization, growth, and valuation. Samit has been early in identifying and investing in multiple businesses across industries, before they caught the market attention. He's popularly known as the mid-cap master in the investing circle. And I have personally found a lot of knowledge when I read his memos on a monthly basis. So Samit, a very warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Ankita. That was really generous of you. I don't know whether I deserve it, but you know, I, I will keep trying. Thank you. Uh, so, Samit, as I was mentioning in the start, uh, the growth forecast for this year is negative. Uh, recovery now seems to be flattening. Inflation is high, putting a monetary backstop. Fiscal has lagged our expectations. So, amidst all this, how difficult is it to generate an alpha? And what strategy are you following for picking up stocks in this environment? Yes, so I think, uh, you know, in most of the turnarounds, I think there is going to be a big divergence between how the stock market does and how the economy you feel is doing. So say, for example, I'm invested in a structural steel pipes uh, company, right? And uh, we have been invested in, in that for last, you know, five years. And so it gives me a lot of in-depth knowledge about, you know, by tracking it for last five years of how the industry is doing. Now there are many informal players. Uh, even mm -hmm. say between Pune and Bombay, there are at least 20 right? and uh, there is this uh, you know, large uh, company which is basically 40% of the market. Now if you talk to these 20 players, you will get a really gloomy picture about the economy and you know about how the GDP is doing because overall industry is not doing that well, it's still down. But then the one which is listed on the stock market, it had a 32% growth in September quarter. You know, so there is going to be a huge divergence because of you know the environment is so difficult. So it, it is becoming very difficult for the weaker players to survive in this kind of a environment. And that benefit is going to the really high quality, strong player who has huge score competencies. So that's where you know stock picking comes in. That you might see a lot of negative environment around you mainly because you're talking to 20 against one right 20 doing badly against one doing well and that's where as an investor you do get a lot of opportunities the good thing is not many people are so excited about the market and the opportunity so you do get reasonable valuation i wouldn't say they're as attractive say in march or or april but i think this is pretty common across that you will see a lot of negative news on the gdp side but good on the stock market side and inflation sometimes is really good for the if it's a controlled inflation it is good for the companies because you know they do get some pricing power and their margins improve and that's what i think in the september quarter you'll see a lot of companies reporting much better margins even compared to the year ago so some factors which may seem negative from a macro point of view may be really good for from a micro point of view and again, if you're a good stock picker, you know, you can differentiate which will benefit which company then accordingly build your portfolio. Okay. 
So I think you very well brought about the difference between the top-down perspective and how things change when you look bottoms up. And especially, I think your focus has been on companies that could outperform the nominal GDP because largely because they are taking up a larger market share, uh, increasing the addressable market, have that kind of growth and opportunity lined up. Now, uh, as we stand today, we also are facing problems with related to credit. Leverage has become an issue and especially for a lot of players, the borrowing costs, despite the easing, is very, very high. So not just leverage, but with other parameters included too. What do you make of the earning potential? Uh, do you think it's going to be the big getting bigger or do you think uh, there's a chance of the breadth playing out as far as the earnings are concerned? Right. No, I think it's going to be a struggle for the breadth playing out. So again, this high interest uh, or difficult to get loans or debt is going to mm -hmm. again benefit the stronger players because first of all the stronger players actually have reduced their debt over the last many years today if you see mm -hmm. across the board the debt to equity ratio is at the lowest end in the last few years at the total level it seems cute you know high mainly because of some large debt laden companies which are not doing well. But if you look at the median level of debt to equity in a good quality company, it's probably towards the lower end of, of debt. And there is a huge differential. So again, I will go back to this example, you know, of this structural steel pipes company. For them, getting a working capital loan today is at six and a half percent. Whereas if you go to any of the informal players, it probably will be at 15% if they get it. Okay. So yeah. that itself is a huge. So of course, at a broader level for the breadth, to do well at the earnings level, the ease of getting credit has to you know, improve. And that hasn't improved, actually it's gotten tough. Okay, okay. So, uh, I mean, we all want the breadth to be played out and we want the next bull run to be more inclusive. But given that it is uh, the way the fundamentals are aligned and it looks difficult, what is what are the key parameters that you are taking into mind while, while constructing your portfolio now? Are you aggressively buying at these valuations? And uh, what is it that you think is a right time to buy? And how would you diversify it? Right. So see, see the, there are very few times when it helps to time the market. And that too, again, when, you know, I've tried to present in my memo is that, you know, I try to look at it from this framework is that whether the risk is known and whether the impact of that risk is known or not. So, for example, when we looked at, say, March, you know, COVID was completely unknown as well as what impact it would have on the economy was also completely unknown. So if we are good at timing the market, you know, at the initial stages of that risk playing out, maybe it helped you. But if you are even just a couple of weeks late, it just didn't make sense time the market so whenever like today the risks which are known to the markets is covid the credit risk you know the economy not doing well you know government not executing well all of those risks are pretty known so that is not something which will create a new crash crashes are created by something which is completely unknown and unknown is very difficult to time so that's where i don't spend too much time in trying to time the time the market what you do is try to figure out which are the best, you know, say 15, 16 companies which are for the portfolio. So in terms of building the portfolio, what I look for is, again, that dominance of that company against the competition. Because I think that's the best way of reducing the risk and protecting your capital. In a weak environment, those companies tend to do exceedingly well because the weaker companies either go out of business or they don't even get working capital to grow their business. So, you know, that presents an opportunity to at least grow from taking away market share. If the economy is doing well anyway, every, everyone does well. So, you know, so by getting into such companies, it protects you from that huge downside risk that presents during any crash or, you know, any downside in the, in the economy. So you don't change the way you look at the portfolio. You keep on just finding that because for me, until the credit issue gets solved for India, you can't blindly put money just broadly into the market. You will have to bet on these leaders in any segment that you that you like. So that's what I stick to. Okay, so I think Howard Marks also once said that there are no brains in the bull run. And while we are not there, we are just trying to minimize the risk 
uh, that's getting there. But Samit, one important point that you just mentioned is that you look at uh, companies that could uh, get a higher market share vis-a-vis -vis competition. And you said you have about 15 to 16 of those names. Do you believe in sectoral diversification? How did right. you build up on this strategy? Uh, I mean, are there any personal experiences involved yeah. there? Yeah, so see again, there is a big difference between how an individual investor will build up a portfolio versus how a fund manager will build up a portfolio. Sure. Right. Yeah. So I will give an example, you know, to, to make this point again. For an individual portfolio, you are just managing one account. Right. So for example, mm -hmm. today I make a portfolio of say 10 stocks right, and invest 10% in each of those stocks. One of the stock could become a multi-bagger. Right. Generally happens like one or two stocks you know, tend to become multi baggers sure. So say other nine names stay flat over the next one year, but one of the stock goes up 4x. So it becomes 40% of the portfolio and the remaining is only 60% of the portfolio. For an individual investor, because you now get a lot of cushion to hold on to that holding. Whereas for a fund manager, I would get new money every moment. Right. So I can't something which has gone forex, you know, I can't add 40% of my portfolio to, you know, match my model portfolio. So the way a portfolio is constructed for a fund manager has to be very different than what an individual because for an individual investor, because his buying price can be at a very low level, he doesn't have to add at higher level and he can maintain that portfolio composition, uh, you know, the, the way and Hence, a portfolio manager cannot generate as higher returns as an individual because he can never have a 40% allocation, however highly convinced he is on that, on that stock. So as a fund manager, I'll tell you how I think, right? So you do sure. need diversification. If I, individually, you know, I can have a five, six stock portfolio and, but as a fund manager, I can't do that because there is liquidity issue. You know, so a lot of factors play into, let me talk about, you know, those factors to build up a portfolio, at least, you know, by understanding the rational, someone can tweak, you know, how they want to build their own, own portfolio, right? So for me, technically, at 16 stock portfolio, you can diversify away 95% of your systemic, you know, market risk, right? So that gives me that I need to go, you know, closer to that 16, so that I'm not taking too much of uh, market uh, risk, right? Second is how many stocks can I really closely follow and understand those businesses? The more number of portfolio, uh, portfolio companies, it becomes more and more difficult to in depth, you know, understand those businesses in depth. So there has to be a limit, you know, so that, you know, for me that 15, 16 is sort of a balance where it's easy enough for me to track them very closely. At the same time, I'm not really diversifying away, you know, that I'm not concentrating too much, that it gives me too much of risk at a, at a business level. So that's where, I mean, everyone would have their own. I mean, there are fund managers who just, you know, uh, with large funds only invest in five, six stocks. That's fine. But then when you invest in five, six stocks, those are really well-known companies with really low risk. That's the only way you can, you know, concentrate so much. But when you are a fund manager like me, who is looking for a mid cap and small cap, you know, where a lot of the companies are not well known, they may not also have the history of like 15, 20 years where you can see what has happened during just a couple of down cycles. So that also makes sense for me to have little higher number of companies, you know, in, in, in the portfolio. So for me, again, bottom line is balance of enough diversification to diversify away most of the systemic risk. At the same time, having ability to track them closely so that at least I have some edge in understanding those businesses versus most of the other investors. I think it's really important for you to be able to track them. Now, when it comes to tracking an activity on one's portfolio, uh, where would you rate yourself? Do, are, you, are you someone who tracks the portfolio every day, takes decisions based on price, or are you more of someone who would hold uh, for longer and wait and let it play out. So what is your exit strategy and what is that one trigger when it's it's always a sell? Right. You don't need to track the prices on a daily basis, but you do need to track the businesses uh, very, very actively because you don't know. In India, you know, it is an emerging country. 
lot of thing, things can you know can change you know there are regulatory changes which can happen there could be complete disruption which can you know happen there could be accidents which happen at the company level so you do need to track the businesses very very closely and uh, hence see again uh, there are two ranges of how you of the holding period right so there is that warren buffett the latest warren buffett kind of philosophy where you buy and hold and then buy forever whereas the other one is more of trading you know you do a lot of you know you take a lot of tech, tactical calls i am somewhere in between because of what i look for in a portfolio what i look for is companies who can double their earnings in next 3 to 4 years and at every point in time you know that company has to meet that parameter right so i may find a company which you know meets that parameter at time 0 but at time 3 maybe that growth rate has slowed down so if it doesn't meet my criteria then i tend to exit that company irrespective of you know what the price is or what the valuation valuation is so for me fundamentally the business if it doesn't meet my criteria that becomes the primary exit exit point and hence my average holding period tends to be in that 3 to 5 year kind of a range because that doubling earnings every 3 to 4 years is not something which will continue for a very long period of time you know so I, it's for me it's more like a relay race that you know i find set of companies but in next 5 to 6 years almost entirely or you know, most of my portfolio tends to be a different portfolio than what say existed at the start of that you know five year period yeah sure so i think you rate yourself somewhere between forget and hold and then taking action on those mark to market movements uh samit where did you pick this investing style from uh how did you find that balance that you know discovering that you would want so many companies and you are comfortable holding it for four years uh did you initially like a lot of young traders uh struggle between being an investor and a trader so what are those personal experiences that brought you to where you are today in terms of your investing philosophy yes yes no i mean that has been very crucial uh my start in investment field was in 1990 and that's when i completed my mba and that you know first time i had some money because i got the signing bonus but unfortunately that was you know the peak of the market it was the dot com bubble okay. and then as a newcomer you know you tend to invest in companies which are you know well covered by the analysts and are highly recommended by analysts and generally they tend to be at the peak so i invested in them of course you know started losing money because the bubble burst and as you start losing money as a newbie does that you try to then leverage and you know to make up that loss and that actually adds up to the loss and then you know it exaggerates the the loss so that's where you know actually my learning started i thought that i learned maybe 10% of my investment skills in the mba or you know in the education but more <laughs> through this experience and then reading books you know post that you of course i mean the the loss is so hurtful right because first time you have the money and you lost all that money and with you know the kind of background i had before so that's where i started you know reading all kinds of books figuring out you know what's work what really matches my temperament and then in 2006 i came to india you know that's where mm-hmm. i think there is a huge difference between how you manage money in the us versus what you manage in india if you look at the big multi baggers in the us market they tend to be in the branded players or where you have huge moats like you know whether it's the pharma ip or tech ip or these huge brands which really you don't have much available in india either you have those handful of mncs which have brands but those are not really you know home grown brands mm-hmm. you don't really Uh, mostly you have generic ips you know you have very service oriented it companies and most of the other companies are commoditized you know whether you look at the specialty chemicals whether you look at the manufacturing uh, sector and if you look at the multi baggers in india they have been mainly from the commodity side so in the i put even finance as the commodity side right so finance has been consistent compounders whereas in the last decade the the biggest compounders have been either in the specialty chemical side or the pharma uh, side in the 
2000s decade the first decade of this century the the compounders were mainly from infrastructure space or the real estate space because we had a boom the capex boom, boom during that that time brands and you know consumer oriented companies have done well consistently but their returns have been nowhere compared to these you know 6 7 year kind of themes which played out you know during the first decade and the second decade so again because of what's available in the indian market you got to tweak what you look for right so okay. if you are going to find the best earnings growth companies in these themes which plays out you know over a decade it doesn't last for multi decades you got to be invested in those companies so in this decade you know again i have been because you find the earning growth in these companies you are invested in lot of specialty chemical companies you know some financials uh, you know some pharma and you don't know when that theme is going to change or when it's going to lose steam as soon as that theme loses steam which means that the growth drops below 20% kind of a trigger you have to exit it and find something new you know which is emerging it could be contract manufacturing it could be completely some niche manufacturing but that's what help me tweak to you know take it down from the warren buffett kind of investing which is buy and hold forever which maybe works in the in the us but in india the ideal balance i found is not going to the trading way but also not going the completely buy and forget way but somewhere in between which is you know 3 to 5 year kind of holding period where you take advantage of a particular theme and then you know it's a relay race that you play that was actually uh, very good to listen for a lot of young traders who've come to the market uh, very very recently we've seen a retail category boom that has happened uh, a i think uh, it's very important for a lot of us to understand that investing the us style does not work in india and b i think as you mentioned specialty chemicals pharma and financials are what you are invested in for now uh is this is this the, is this one thing that you think will play out in the coming decade or not one has covid changed uh the themes that you think will emerge out and secondly uh this is a more behavioral and generic questions as i was mentioning so there are a lot of young uh retail participation that has increased during the time of covid as numbers have been telling us uh on the behavioral side what do you think of it uh would would you have an advice for them and on the financial side do you think uh it is true that retail as a segment could keep market afloat is, is do they have the ability in the first sense right no i will start with i think the learnings that because even i started during sort of a boom market and lot of uh, young investors probably started in the last 8 uh, 9 months when you know they got to work from home and a lot of uh, you know got involved in trading and the first few months experience must have been really good what a bull market does is that it invites sort of wrong learnings because downside is what really teaches you what not to touch whereas in a bull market everything works so you don't really know what exactly has worked for you you know even wrong things have worked for you good things have worked for you so what i would say is that in a bull market don't get carried away and uh, you know get too much confident of betting more and more on similar kind of things try to rather than committing the mistakes yourself try to learn from you know previous downsides try to talk to investors who have seen multiple down downsides because you will face one pretty soon right so and what happens is that as the mistake that i committed was that once the downside starts you try to leverage yourself to make up that loss faster but then that's just a downhill you are just exaggerating the downhill and that's something that one is to avoid that leveraging should be minimal at a stage when you are learning and leveraging should increase once you gain you know at least one or two decade or one or two cycles of experience you know which could be in 5 years or 6 years until that point just lie low bet and try to understand the businesses in depth rather than you know trying to figure out when is the market going to go up or down and trying to time too much i think in the initial phase people spent too much time on trying to time the mar- market because that does not add any skills over the long run what will benefit is your understanding of the 
businesses. That's a compounding skill and it's irreplaceable. It's invaluable because that's something that needs to keep on compounding over a period of period of time. So whatever skill you have today, 10 years down the line, you will have, you know, 10x the skill that you have today because no one can match that experience. No one can fast forward that, that experience. I would say focus uh, on, on, on that. And one good thing is that at least SEBI this time has, you know, reduced uh, or increased the margin requirements. So hopefully there wouldn't be too much of leverage in the system and there is not much leverage in the system. So it automatically protects a lot of newbies who probably want to leverage and you know make very quick bucks. So that's a good thing that the regulators, you know, have, have done. Um, so that's what I would say. And I, sorry, what was the other question that you asked, uh, I think before this? I was just asking, has COVID uh, changed the themes that you see upcoming for the decade after? Is it still, uh, are you still right. f focusing on specialty chemicals, pharma and financial? Yeah. Or are you scouting for new themes now? No, see, you always scout for new things, new themes. Because as I said, you know, mine is not a buy and forget kind of a strategy. So you need mm -hmm. to be on top of uh, whatever themes you hold in your portfolio. Because you can never know when it's going to change. You know, it can just change in one year, it can last for five years, right? So for example, like say when you invested, when I invested in say Bajaj Finance in 2009-10, it I didn't know that it's going to last for 10 years. I thought, you know, my investment horizon is always going to be two to three years or three years, four years. You, But you just keep on top of it. And after three years, if you think this theme is going to even last for three more years, you keep on, you know, holding it. So it's a rolling kind of a holding period. That you keep on evaluating in that rolling kind of a you know holding period, you might find something new, and you start in that that theme. Some themes in this may, because you don't like for example when I build a portfolio, I don't invest more than twenty five percent in any given theme, right? So specialty okay. chemical, I will cap it to twenty five percent. I would not. So I will have generally about at least five to six different themes in a portfolio, right? Not all of them will work together because. If all of the themes are working together, that means there is something wrong in diversification of the portfolio. You don't want sure. everything to go up and down at the same time that increases the volatility. You want to make sure that whatever businesses you hold in the portfolio, their, driver, their drivers are very divergent. So for example, even if you are say invested in an in auto company, auto companies, right? So say someone who's manufacturing agriculture tires, versus someone is, who's manufacturing, say, engines uh, for normal cars. The drivers of the businesses are very different because agri tires is more based on, and if it's export oriented, it's more based on, you know, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the monsoon, whereas what's happening in the car, you know, it depends, it's very cyclical and it, uh, you know, goes along with the economy. So that's where you need to be very careful when you build a portfolio, the drivers of the businesses have to be sort of contra so that it protects you, you know, going up and down at the same, same, same time. So similar is, is with the themes that you want to diversify even the themes and within those themes also you want to diversify across players where they also don't go up and down, you know, at the same time and track them very closely so that you can get out of a particular theme and you know, catch on to a new theme. And again, as I said, it's a relay, not everything changes hand at the same time. Each of those six or seven themes can change hand, hands at different point in, point in time. But that's how you, you know, keep on updating your portfolio. Thanks, Amit. So it has been very insightful thus far. And I think I can sum up the key takeaways as being uh, look for companies which can give a higher market share and therefore could generate a doubling growth. Not, do not be in the forget and hold category, constantly evaluate, but somewhere in the intermediate period. So thank you, thank you for coming over today. Uh, I would, before I end this, I would still ask you, how important is the emotional quotient for you and what do you do about it for personal investing? Yeah, I mean, see, emotional quotient for a fund manager is extremely important. You know, at an individual level where you really don't, you are not answerable to anyone. You know, the stress level is under your control. You know, at least it can be controlled by controlling your own emotions. But when you're a fund manager, you are answerable, especially in a down cycle. There will be 10 investors who will be asking you what's happening and why is my portfolio down? So, um, 
for me meditation you know of course uh, helps um, i read a lot of uh, you know uh, spiritual books so differentiating between you know what is material versus what is the core to you is important so that you give more importance to the core and uh, you know give less importance to what you know is material you try to give your best of course but then don't get too much impacted by the ups and downs you know of the market uh, that is just part of the game everything in life is cyclical same is with the with the markets so once you i think have that sort of reality in the background you will not get as much uh, affected so you stick with it main thing is your peace of mind you know whether it's in terms of even allocation at the stock level whether it's in terms of what kind of investors you accept in the fund first focus has to be will, what will maintain the peace of mind for me and uh, you know not being too ambitious not being too greedy in just trying to build up the you know the fund whenever the money comes in be very very you know sure of when the money that you accept the markets are at least in your favor and that reduces lot of stress because as a fund manager uh, the 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 stress level can can be in finite be higher than as an individual uh, investor so you know those those things uh, you know definitely definitely help me i'm sure so core principles and prioritizing the peace of mind i think is very important and we are all trying to learn from you and others as we progress on the path of investing uh, and investing really is not that different from life as you said they are all they all move in cycles and they should be taken one step at a time thanks amit thanks for joining us today it was a pleasure my pleasure thank you so much for having me until then keep calm keep investing